things have, with the help of Ambra and uh, MA have been exceptionally uh, profitable, I think. Um, and I just want to ask them to come up for uh, a second or two, a minute or two, and tell you a little bit about what they're doing. So any of you want to volunteer to come first? Kevin's got a camera in his hand, so maybe he should go last at the moment. Um, Jim or Bettina, would you care to step up? Tell us what you're doing. <laughs> So a week ago, um, I decided what I was going to be doing for the last week, and um, I thought that I would look into the excavation reports and try to excavate back to 1767 and see what, um, what evidence there was. And I was really surprised that this has not been collected before. Um, the excavation reports are very spotty. They mention the highlights, the arbor that was found, the gold, and so forth, but they're not specific about which rooms. But when you get a general view of what was found, also from um, artistic views and descriptions of travelers. So that's what I've been looking at and trying to piece together from 1767 up to the present what's happened to the Project Horticus. And uh, a, a particularly good find I thought was here in the archives, archival photographs from the 1980s and, and 1990s, uh, which the roof and the columns were taken apart and reconstructed. And so taken down to lower levels, um, and, and I was able to photograph all of those. Um, so what's emerged is that there are many really um, spectacular objects that were taken off the walls, that were taken out of the rooms and transported to the Bourbon Museum in Portici. Some of them have gotten lost along the way. Some of them are in the uh, storerooms at Naples. And um, I may tomorrow be able to see some of those that are brought right up out of the storerooms. There are also some drawings that were made before the frescoes were removed um, that I'm trying to track down with the help of Andra. Um, one room in particular is the main entrance that we go through from the, from the main gate. That was the central room, and it was really beautifully painted with armor, gladiatorial armor. Um, and there was a lot of gladiatorial armor found right in that room, as you probably know. Um, but in the center of the walls, between these uh, very Trump boy, really illusionistic representations of armor, was a panel of Mars and Venus with Mars's armor, or Mars having been disarmed by Venus. So there was a play between the armor and this erotic mythological scene. So clearly, um, this whole end, the south end, uh, was really focused on uh, the gladiators um, and their equipment. Um, so that's really what I have to report. Thank you, Bettina. because you know, one of the things that we came here, one of the reasons why we called this building the Quadriporticus rather than calling it the, the, the Quarter of the Soldiers or the, uh, or the Gladiator Barracks as it's been called for years was because we wanted to look at it without the bias of other interpretations. And so we've come at it largely from just an architectural perspective and Bettina is really filling in all the color to our kind of gray on gray de deconstruction of the Quadriporticus. Um, speaking of architecture, Jim's going to tell us a little bit about what he's done. Okay, so uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, here as a, a modern-day architect uh, visiting from here to see what I can learn. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, so much knowledge in terms of the, the historical aspect, but uh, it's very interesting to me to see what can be learned um, from, from ancient Pompeii that could be incorporated or is being incorporated into these buildings. So uh, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, the House of the Tragic Poet as a lens to see uh, what kind of techniques um, uh, could be used with the intention of putting together a, a virtual model of the house as it would have been. So a few things that I found interesting are, uh, first of all, the construction techniques, which is, as far as I can tell, um, uh, were, were very good in, in, in that period uh, leading up to, to 79 AD. Um, um, and, and it's interesting to see just how much of it was survived and how much of the reconstruction is falling down. Um, but but uh, also the, the uh, ideas of environmental sustainability that the Romans were using are uh, in many ways coming full circle. So after a period of, of, uh, of, of just mass air conditioning in the 1970s where, where modern architecture basically just built boxes and put very large air conditioning systems on, we're now returning to um, using environmentally sustainable systems of, of uh, passive 
filtering, cooling, and recycling rainwater, just like the, the, the Romans did in their houses. So that's really interesting. Uh, thirdly, it's um, what I find interesting as, as an architect working um, uh, in, in contemporary context um, is the, 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 uh, the archaeological, archaeological methods that you all are using to trace the various levels of the site. Because every building that we build now is built in a context of, of, of history. So the site is, is a palimpsest which goes back hundreds of thousands of years. So that's all very interesting to me as well. And it's great to see uh, how Eric and, and, and you all are, are using uh, technology um, in terms of the, the computer databases and such. first started talking about this collaboration, um, I was very excited of the idea of doing something like that, of doing, getting in and doing photogrammetry inside the, the house and building a, photo, a photogrammetric model in that way, specifically because Bettina has written uh, an important article about using that house as, as memory data, which many of you will, will know, and I'm hopeful that we can we can do some of that, that work still in the future, so what you're, what you're doing is, is still exciting. The, the last person we're going to talk about here is Kevin Anderson, and he's gonna, I'm probably going to switch the camera. Switch around, take the camera. Mr. Deville is ready for his close-up. Oh, oh yeah. All right, Kevin, why don't you give us a, a rundown? <clears throat> okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first off, I just want to thank everyone for their uh, cooperation and toleration of me coming around, <laughs> sticking cameras in people's faces, and sometimes you're like caught up in what you're doing, and, and then realizing that you've been being videotaped that whole time and, and all that. So, um, so I just want to thank because what I'm doing would not be even possible without you guys. Um, so I came onto this project, you know, after speaking with Eric, about um, kind of doing somewhat of an ethnography of the whole process, of the, of the site, but also the people, and people's interpretations of your work here, what you're finding, um, the kind of conclusions you're making, um, as well as a little bit about the teamwork and, and then the structure of the, of the whole thing with the, the two projects going on in parallel. And so, um, one thing uh, that I've certainly discovered is, uh, and a, a lot will of course be, uh, I think, uh, discovered down the road after I've been going through the footage and everything, but even just as I've been shooting for the past week, um, just a real high level of enthusiasm, cooperation, and knowledge that I'm doing my best to try to capture on camera instead of just getting like little snippets of this and there, uh, pieces <coughs> here and there, um, trying to follow people to a certain extent. To, so in one way that's limited, how much time I can spend with everybody. I have tended to concentrate on uh, some groups more than others because I've followed them from the beginning. I want to get that sense of process. Um, but I'm going to try to finish that out this week by um, spending more time with some of the other groups and other people. Um, I think what I'll be putting together for, uh, for the project and for Eric and Stephen is something that can be used as, a, I think, a rather convincing, compelling, informational, uh, even educational documentary about um, your, your finds here, as well as the again the kind of social uh, structure behind it. The um, uh, well, I branched out from that to talk to tourists. Um, Francesca was very uh, or Amy, Amy was very uh, helpful in going around the other day to speak with vendors about their interpretations of the tourists, the tourist industry, the site, the relationship between Pompeii Modern and the site here. Um, we spent a little bit more time this week uh, talking to more tourists. And so hopefully uh, what is produced in the end are essentially two things. One is uh, a shorter piece on specifically what you guys are doing here, and then the other a slightly longer piece entertaining um, some larger questions about uh, the role of archaeology, um, what Pompeii, uh, antique Pompeii means to the locals here who work in it. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the hours. I think I'm up to close to 15 hours of footage now. Um, I'll be going through the rest of the summer, and uh, I know there's an AIA conference in Seattle, and I'm really going to push to have something done that could ideally be shown there. So if people are planning on going there in Seattle, we can um, catch up in my hometown, and I can uh, show you around, and we can uh, reach you the end. So that's about it. Thank you, Kevin.
just until through Tuesday. They're going to go back on Wednesday morning. Uh, so if you have burning questions, if you haven't had a chance to get that one piece of information you wanted to get, you have to get it fast. So uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, Allison, do we have anything left other than getting to work? I don't think so. Could I talk to supervisors real fast? And I think everyone